Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? It's been a while. I know, it really has. It really has. Last time I edited a video was like three months ago. I was like, I need to get back on this. <laughs> <laughs> back in 2023. <laughs> wow, so last year. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so how you been? Been doing pretty good. Um, traveling a lot, which has been fun. Uh, seeing oh most of the states and uh, accidentally drove into Mexico at one point. It was fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fun story. Um, first time out of the country too. It was the best. Uh awesome. yeah. But um to those listening, thank you for joining back into these videos. Um we've had some off and ons this year, so thank you for your patience. And uh we're talking about Hogwarts Legacy because who's not playing it right now? If you're not, no offense. Um so <laughs> We were just talking about the history of Ollivander. Curious if anybody mm -hmm. has ideas about what Ollivander would have been doing before Ollivander, as in the family, would have been doing before the founding of Hogwarts. Because Hogwarts was not founded until 1000 AD, but Ollivander's family began their wand making in what year, Jamie? 382 BC. Yeah, 382 BC. That's a long history before the founding. So, like, like where were they before Hogwarts? Where were they before Diagon Alley? Where were they before England? Yeah. What were they... Who were they yeah. making wands for? Mm, exactly. What mm. trials and tribulations did they have to deal with back in the, the Dark Ages? Yeah, and like, who did did they sell wands to the founders of Hogwarts? Yeah, like, is that where did they got the, their wands? Yeah, did, did the wands? Did the, well, I think we know that Slytherin fashioned his own wand. Okay. I think we know that. So, I don't know. Hmm. So let's see. Let's see your 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 drinking material today. Right. Ravenclaw, right. of course. Ravenclaw. Leatherin, boom. <laughs> Representing the houses today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> nice, nice. I wore black to accentuate the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this this necklace reminds me of the swirly magic, the ancient magic in Hogwarts yep. uh, legacy. Just so. green in that, a little bit of, little bit of Slytherin in that. Well, I mean, I gotta show my support and camaraderie, <laughs> you know. As as G. Norman Lippert would say, Ravenclaws and Slytherins are the ones that kind of nod at each other in the hallway, like respect, you know. Because mm -hmm. I think that um we talked about how Slytherins probably recruit Ravenclaws for like ideas and strategy about things they're trying to do without telling them all the details, like how deep. A hole should I dig to bury a thing of this dimension? You know, <laughs> but I'm not asking any questions. You do your thing, um, but I'll give you the math. You know, yeah. As long as as long as there's knowledge to gain for the Ravenclaw, I don't think they're gonna care. <laughs> yeah. So we have done chapters one through eleven so far. Um, James and Zane and. Ralph have been through some adventures already in their first year at Hogwarts. Um, and on chapter 12, we've just found out that there's three relics that they need to find in order to prevent possibly somebody trying to bring Merlin back from the dead. So that's kind yeah. of where we are. Like we know there's three relics. We don't know what's going on after that. Yep. And something about yeah. the Hall of Elders Crossing. Da -da -da. Yep. Oh, um, this way. Yep. <laughs> there it is. Nice. I like how you have the darker yeah. version and I've got like the lighter one going on here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I feel like though, this is like like chapters one through 11 and this yours is 
I don't know where you are on my screen. Yours is uh, more chapters 12 and forward. I feel like we're getting to that yeah. darker, darker portion. So yeah. fasten your seatbelts. Absolutely. So I'm going to let you start if that's okay. Okay. Um, that's fine with me. There is a, there is a part where Ralph comes in the door and I was going to take over after that. Absolutely. Yep, no problem. Cool. Okay. Chapter 12. Vism in Neptio. The first hurdle James, Ralph, and Zane faced in capturing Jackson's briefcase was simply finding a case similar enough to make the switch. It was, as Zane had suggested, a fairly basic black leather case rather more like a doctor's bag than a briefcase. They studied it carefully at dinner Monday evening as it sat between the professor's black boots beneath the faculty table. It had been, sorry, it had two wooden handles on the top, a hinged brass catch, and was indeed rather beaten and scuffed. They were dismayed to discover that it had a small tarnished brass plate riveted to one side with T.H. Jackson engraved on it. While it was, in most respects, an almost entirely unremarkable bit of luggage, the boys soon discovered that there was not, in fact, one exactly like it to be easily found. Plenty of students and faculty had leather cases and portfolios, but they were all either too narrow or the wrong colour or of a rather different size or shape. By Tuesday night, they had still not found a case that they could use to perform the switch. Ralph suggested that they might have to wait until next week to perform the switch, but James was insistent that they keep trying. We don't know when they're planning to bring all the relics together, he explained. If we wait too long, They'll try it, and then we won't have access to any of the relics at all. They'll figure out if they don't work, and then hide them or destroy them. Ralph and Zane agreed, although it didn't get them any closer to finding an appropriate case to use for the switch. Then, Wednesday morning, the day of technomancy class, Ralph came to the breakfast table with a manic glint in his eye. He popped down across from Zane and Jane and stared at them. What? James asked. I think I found us a case we can use. James's mouth dropped open and Zane audibly gulped the coffee he'd been sipping. What? Where? James asked in a harsh whisper. He had decided they were going to have to wake up for all and had been simultaneously worried and relieved. Now adrenaline, adrenaline shot through him. The rather wide-eyed paleness of Ralph's face indicated he was feeling the same thing. You know my friend, Rufus Burton? James nodded. Yeah, another first-year Slytherin. Creasy head kid, right? Yeah, well, he collects rocks and stuff. Calls himself a rock elf. He has a whole bunch of polished little stones arranged on a shelf by his bed. Crystals and quartzes and moon sapphires and all that. I listened to him talking about it last night for almost an hour. Well, he brought all his rock hunting tools along with him to school, of course. He's got a little hammer that's a pick on one side and a bunch of little scrapers and brushes and loads of these little cloths and polishing solutions. All right, all right, they said. We get the picture. Guys are geek with tools. I'm spellbound. What's the point? Well, Ralph said, unperturbed, he carries all his tools and gear around in a case and he had it out on his bed last night. And it's the right size and shape, James prompted. Ralph nodded, still eyes, wide-eyed. It's almost perfect, even has a little plaque on the side. It has the name of the manufacturer on it, but it's in the same place as the little plate on Jackson's head. The colour's different, and the handles are ivory, but other than that... So how do we get it? James asked breathlessly. I've already got it, Ralph answered, seeming rather amazed at himself. I told him I wanted a bag to carry my books and parchments. Told him that my backpack didn't feel very, you know, Slytherin. He said he knew just what I meant. He said he'd gotten a new tool case for Christmas so I could have his old one. 
that's why he had it out. He was taking everything out of the old one and putting it into his new case, which was bigger and has a hard dragon skin cover. Watertight, he told me. Ralph was beginning to ramble. He just said you could have it, Zane asked incredulously. Yeah. I've got to tell you, it winked me out a bit. I mean, isn't that just a little, I don't know, a little too much of a coincidence, Zane added? Just grew, just, James grew thoughtfully determined. Where's the case now? Ralph looked a little startled. I brought it down with me, but I hid it in one of the cubby holes under the stairs. I didn't want anyone to see, see me with it here, just in case. Good thinking. Come on, James said, getting up. You still want to go through with it. I was just going to say, I think those three lines are very aligned with their houses. Zane is like, it's a little too much of a coincidence. Like he's thinking about it, you know, the Ravenclaw yep. style. James is like, where's the case now? Let's do this. You know, Gryffindor style. And Ralph yep. is like, yep. um, I mean, I snuck it into a thing you know, to, so nobody would <laughs> see me. You know, I just think it's really funny how that all kind of comes together yeah. there. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, James is very much like, let's just do it. Go, do it now. And everyone's like, maybe you should just wait a little bit, you know? Yep. <laughs> um, uh, you still want to go through with it, Rafa, following reluctantly. I mean, we were going to wait until next weekend, weren't we? That was only because we didn't have a choice. Well, Ralph muttered. There's always a choice. I mean, we don't have to do it this way, do we? Couldn't one of us just hide under the invisibility plate and make the switch when Jackson's not looking? Zane shook his head. No way. There's too little room in there. Jackson would run you over doing one of his laps. If we're going to do it, this is the only way. Look, I think we're meant to do this, James said, turning to face Ralph and Zane when they got to the doorway. If this is such, if there is such a thing as destiny, then that's what put that case in your hands last night, Ralph. We can't miss this opportunity. It'd be like, like spitting in destiny's face. Ralph blinked, trying to envision that. Zane scowled thoughtfully. Sounds serious. Are you two still with me? James asked. Both other boys nodded. The case was still in the cubby hole beneath the main staircase and it was as similar to Jackson's as Ralph had described it. It was a ruddy red colour, and much more scuffed from having been dragged through the dirt and rocks. But it was exactly the same size and shape, with a matching brass hat in the centre. Ralph had already stuffed his dress coat into it, and when James opened it to check, it looked almost exactly the way the cloth inside Jackson's case had looked when it had come open that day in Franklin's classroom. Let's take it to the boys' bathroom in the upper cellars, James said, preceding the other two down the staircase. It's just down the hall from Technomancy. Do you need anything special, Zane? Just my wand and my note, Zane answered. Horace Birch had been more than happy to explain the Bism in Nephew charm to Zane, but there'd been no opportunity for him to practice. Further, the charm would only work, if it worked at all, on anyone who didn't know the charm was in place. The result was that neither James, Ralph, nor Zane would know if the charm was working. They'd just have to trust Zane's spell work until the switch had been accomplished and Jackson picked up the fake case. Only then, one way or the other, would the effectiveness of the charm be shown. In the boys' bathroom, James popped the case on the edge of the sink. Zane dug in his backpack for his wand and the bit of parchment he scribbled the Vism Ineptio incantation on. He handed the parchment to Ralph. Hold it up so I can see it. He instructed them. His hand was shaking visibly as the point of his wand as he pointed his wand at the case. After a moment, he dropped his arm again. This is all screwy, Ralph the wand master. Can't he try it? Or if put it to you, James said impatiently. It's too late to show Ralph the one motion. Class is in 15 minutes. Yeah, Zane protested. But what if I can't get it to work? 
if Ralph gets it right, you know that he's got good enough to pull anybody. And if he gets it wrong, James insisted, we'll be picking bits of leather off the walls for the next hour. I'm standing right here, remember? Ralph said. James ignored him. You have to, Zane. You can do it. Just give it a go. Zane took a deep breath and then raised his wand again, pointing it at the bag. He looked at the parchment as Ralph held it up. Then, in a low, sing-song voice, he spoke. Light immortal speeds the eye for understanding's vanity. Discordia, the fools ally, make expectations guarantee. Zane flicked his wand in three small circles and then tapped the top of the case with it. There was a popping sound and a very faint ring of light appeared, emanating from the wand's tip. The ring grew, slipping down over the case. It grew fainter until it vanished. Zane let out a breath. Did it work? Ralph asked. It must have, James said. It looks the same to us, of course, but something happened, didn't it? The charm must be in place. I hope so, said Zane. Come on, we've got to get to the classroom before anybody else gets there. They ran through the corridor, Zane and James watching for Professor Jackson and Ralph carrying the fake case with, with his winter coat dragged over it. This looks stupid, Ralph rasped. A look about as casual as warp in a tutu. James shushed him. It doesn't matter. We're almost there. They stopped outside the door to the technomancy classroom. Zane peered in, then turned back to James and Ralph. Plan B, he said under his breath. There's somebody in there. Hufflepuff. Can't, re can't remember his name. James leaned around the corner of the door. It was a boy he vaguely recognized from Muggle Studies class. His name was Terence, and he glanced up as James was looking. Hi, Terence, James called, grinning. He sauntered into the room. Behind him, he heard Ralph and Zane whispering. He tried to drown out their voices. So, how was your holiday? Travel much? I guess, Terence mumbled. This is going to be harder than expected, I thought. So where did you go? If I took the train to London, saw the family and everybody, had loads of fun. Do you go anywhere fun? Terence turned in his seat. Went down to Cork with my mum. It rained for rained most of the trip. Saw a flute concert. James nodded encouragingly. Fortunately, Terence was seated halfway from the front. Turned around towards James. Out of the corner of his eye, James saw Zane near Jackson's desk, positioning the fake case. Terence started to turn back towards the front of the room. A flute concert? James blurted badly. Cool. Terence turned back. No, he said, it wasn't. Zane stood up, giving James the all clear signal. James saw him and sighed with relief. Oh, well, sorry to hear it, he said, backing away from Terence. Anyway, see you around. Zane and James took their planned seats in the front row. It was a small classroom and Jackson's desk was only a couple of feet away. James scanned the front of the room, pleased to see that nothing seemed disturbed. He waited until a few more students came in, laughing and talking, and then whispered to Zane, Where is it? It's in that little corner by the chalkboard. I left the cloak folded a little so it doesn't drape onto the floor. I just hope old Stonewall doesn't trip over it when he goes behind his desk. James looked into the corner that Zane indicated. It, it was just a shallow alcove formed where the closet next door but busted into the room. It was unlikely that Jackson would venture there, but not impossible. Sometimes he doesn't even go behind his desk for all class, James whispered. Zane gave a little lift and drop of his shoulders, as if to say, he is hoping. A few minutes later, Professor Jackson strode into the room, carrying his ever-present leather bag. James and Zane couldn't help watching intently as he draped his cloak over the desk, and settled his briefcase into its accustomed space on the floor next to his desk. Greetings, class, Jackson said briefly. I trust you all had an instructive holiday. One can only hope you haven't forgotten everything we worked so hard to instill in your heads prior to the break. Which reminds me, please hand your essays to the left and then to the front. Mr. Walker, I will collect them from you once you have them all. 
Zane nodded, his eyes bulging a bit. Both James and Zane had their wands slipped up their sleeves. If Jackson noticed, they just say they were carrying them that way in honour of their favourite technomancy teacher, since Jackson himself carried his in a small sheet sewn into his sleeve. Thankfully, Jackson seemed a bit preoccupied. I will be grading your essays tonight, as usual. Until then, let us take a sneak peek, as it were, into your cumulative understanding of the subject. Mr. Hollis, please favour us with a short definition of Hector's Law of Displaced Inertia, if you please. Hollis, a red-cheeked first-year raving for, cleared his throat and began to offer his explanation. James barely heard. He looked down at Jackson's case, sitting tantalizingly only a few feet away. James thought he could probably kick it if he wished to. His heart pounded, and he was filled with a horrible, icy certainty that the plan couldn't possibly work. It had been ridiculously foolhardy to think they could pull such a caper under the proud nose of Professor Jackson. And yet he knew they had to try. He felt vaguely sick with anxiety. Jackson began to pace. Well, different de densities respond to inertia differently based on the proximity of their atoms, Petra answered. A ball of lead will be launched in a single direction. A ball of, say, marshmallow will simply explode. Jackson nodded. Is there a technomantic workaround for this? Anyone? Miss Goyle. Cillian Goyle lowered her hand. A binding spell coupled with the in inertia transference spell will keep either low density substances intact, sir. This has the added benefit that low density projectiles will travel much farther and faster on a, on a given factor of inertia than a higher density projectile, such as Miss Morganson's lead ball. True, Miss Coyle, but not necessarily beneficial. Jackson smiled humorously. A feather shot of a cannon still won't hurt. The class laughed a little at that. Jackson was just getting the second circuit of the room, when suddenly Ralph was at the door. Excuse me, he said in a strangely gurgly voice. Everyone in the class turned except James and Ralph. I'm sorry, I'd seem to have a nosebleed. Ralph's nose was, indeed, bubbling blood at an alarming rate. He held his finger beneath it, and it was coated and slimy with blood. There was a chorus of oohs and ahs from the class, some amused and some disgusted. Zane wasted no time. As soon as he heard Ralph and saw that Jackson was turned away, heading up the right side of the classroom, he whipped his wand from his sleeve. Wingardium Leviosa! He whispered as quietly but as forcefully as he could. The invisibility cloak became visible the moment it whipped up, floating off the fake briefcase in the corner. Zane held it there as James fumbled, fumbled his own wand out. Behind them, they heard Jackson speaking to Ralph. Good heavens, boy, hold still. I'm sorry, Ralph stammered. I bet to get a cough lozard, and I ate one of those weedly nose blood nougats instead. I have to get to the hospital wing, I think. James pointed his wand at the fake briefcase and whispered the levitation charm. The case was much heavier than anything James had levitated before, and he wasn't very good at it under the best of circumstances. The case scuttled on the floor, dragging by a corner. He moved it as close to the real case as possible, knocking the real case aside and partially under the desk. He gasped and then caught his breath. Behind him, the students were laughing and making disgusted noises. Good grief, you don't need the hospital wing, Jackson said, becoming annoyed. Just stand still and move your finger. Ralph began to sway on his feet. A dick of a hemophibian, he yelled. That had been Zane's idea. You are not a hemophiliac. You are not a hemophiliac, Jackson growled. Now for the last time, hold still. James flicked his wand, trying to move the real case around the fake one. It was imperative that he move it into the corner and hide it under the invisibility cloak Zane was still levitating. The real case was stuck, however, wedged under a corner of the desk. James concentrated mightily. The briefcase levitated under the desk, pushing the corner of the desk up with it. James grimaced, lowering his wand, and both the case and the desk clunked to the floor. Nobody seemed to notice. Zane was looking at James, wild-eyed. James made a, grin of, a grimace of helplessness. 
Desperately, Zane made to lower the invisibility cloak onto the real case where it was, wedged under the desk. Somehow, however, the cloak had also become snagged, caught on a coat hook next to the chalkboard. Nothing was going as planned. If anyone turned around now, there would be no hope of covering their tracks. James couldn't resist glancing around. Ralph's nose was still pattering blood. Jackson was half squatted in front of him, one hand on Ralph's arm, trying to pull Ralph's finger away from his nose, the other holding the hickory wand at the ready. The entire class was watching in various shades of amusement and revulsion. Dratic boy, you're making a mess. Move your finger, I tell you, Jackson exclaimed. James tried to free the real briefcase by working it back and forth with his wand. He was sweating, and his hand, his wand hand was slick. The case finally came free, just as James heard Jackson say, Artemise. Oh, Ralph said, rather unnecessarily loudly. There, yes, that's much better. It had it. It did have a It did have been better a minute ago if you'd have listened to me, Jackson said crossly, poking Jackson said crossly, poking his wand back into his sleeve. The scene was over. Zane gave a final yank on his wand. The invisibility cloak popped loose from the coat hook and dropped to the floor in a heap, which promptly vanished. James had no time to hide the briefcase. He sensed the class turning back toward the front of the room. No time to hide the briefcase. That's not good. Please go and wash yourself, young man, Jackson was saying, his voice becoming louder as he dismissed Ralph and turned toward the front of the room. You're an awful sight. People will think you've been mauled by a quintiped. Under his breath, he added, nosebleed nougat. Desperately, James stashed his wand back up his sleeve. Zane, in an act of pure split-second inspiration, shot his legs forward from underneath the desk. He grasped the real briefcase between his ankles, then yanked it back beneath his own desk. James heard the scuffling as Zane tried to stuff the case beneath his chair using only his feet. Jackson stopped next to Zane, and the room became very quiet. <laughs> James tried not to look up. He had the strongest sensation that the professor was looking down at him. Finally, helplessly, he raised his eyes. Jackson was indeed looking down the length of his nose, his gaze moving thoughtfully between Zane and James. James's stomach plummeted. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Jackson continued to the front of the room. Honestly, he said to the class in general, the links some of you will go to skip a class. It astounds someone even as cynical as myself. At any rate, where were we then? Ah, oh, yes. The class wore on. James refused to meet Jackson's eyes. His only hope was to get out of the classroom as quickly as possible. There was no way to collect either the real briefcase or the invisibility cloak while Jackson was there. Just possibly, however, Jackson wouldn't see his own case stuffed beneath James's ch uh, Zane's chair. Everything rested, of course, on the effectiveness of Zane's visum and eptio charm. James looked down at the false briefcase sitting on the floor approximately where the real one had been. To his eye, it looked completely fake, its leather a different color, and its brass plate reading Hiram and Blatwatt's Leathers, Diagon Alley, London, instead of T.H. Jackson. Jackson had obviously sent something. But if the charm worked, there was still the slightest chance they could pull it off. Class finally concluded. James jumped up, hurting Zane ahead of him. Zane shot him a look of pure consternation, his eyes darting toward the base of his chair. But James pushed him onward, shaking his head minute minutely. The class pressed toward the door, and James and Zane, having been seated in the front row, were stuck at the rear of the small throng. James was terrified to look back. Finally, the wall of shoulders and backpacks broke apart, and James and Zane tumbled into the hallway. What are we going to do? Zane whispered frantically as they trotted down the corridor. We'll come back later, James said, struggling to keep his voice low and calm. Maybe he won't see anything. He was packing up the essays when we left. If we just hang back there around the corner, we can watch. Mr. Potter? A voice said imperiously from behind them. Mr. Walker? The two boys stopped in their tracks. They turned very slowly. Professor Jackson was leaning out of the door of the Technazi classroom. I believe you two may have left something in my classroom. Would you care to come collect it? Neither answered. They walked heavily back the way they had come. Jackson disappeared into the classroom again and was waiting behind the front desk when they got there. Come closer, boys, Jackson said in a breezy voice. Just right there in 
just right here in front of the desk, if you please. Placed on the desk in front of Jackson were both the real and fake briefcases. When James and Zane got to the front of the desk, Jackson spoke again, this time in a low, cold voice. I don't know who's been telling you stories about what I keep in my attache, but I can assure you the both of you that yours I can assure the both of you that yours is neither the first nor even the most creative attempt to find out for certain. James raised his eyebrows in surprise, and Jackson nodded at him. Yes, I have heard the tales that some of my students have invented. Stories of horrible dormant beasts, or doomsday weapons, or keys to alternate dimensions, each more terrible and mind-boggling than the last. Let me assure you, though, my terminally curious little friends... Here, Jackson leaned over his desk, bringing his nose less than a foot from the two boys' faces. He lowered his voice further and spoke very clearly. That which I keep hidden in my attache is far, far worse than even your fevered imaginings can contrive. This is not a joke. I am not making idle threats. If you attempt to meddle with my affairs again, you will likely not live to regret it. Am I making myself perfectly clear? James and Zane, <laughs> James and Zane nodded, speechless. Jackson continued to stare at them, breathing through his nose in obvious fury. Fifty points from Gryffindor and fifty points from Ravenclaw. I'd give you both detentions, except that that might lead to questions about this case of mine that I do not wish to answer. Therefore, let me finish by saying, my young friends, that even if you do not so much as look at my attache ever again, I can still choose to make your lives extremely interesting. Please do bear that in mind. Now, he stood back, lowering his eyes, take this pathetic little ruse and be gone. With palpable disgust, Jackson shoved his bag at them with the back of his hand. The fake bag remained sitting in front of him. He laced the knuckly fingers of his right hand through the ivory handles and hefted it. The brass plate that read Hiram and Blatwatt's Leathers, Diagon Alley, London, glinted dully as Jackson moved around the desk. Neither James nor Zane could quite bring themselves to touch the case in front of them. Mm -hmm. Well, Jackson demanded, raising his voice, take that thing and be gone. Y y yes, sir, Zane stammered, grabbing the professor's bag and pulling it off the desk. He and James turned and fled. Three corridors later, they stopped running. They stood in the middle of an empty hall and looked at the bag Jackson had insisted they take. There was no question about it. It was the professor's own black leather briefcase. The nameplate, the nameplate shone clearly, T.H. Jackson. James began to grasp that somehow, amazingly, they had succeeded. They had captured the robe of Merlin. It was the Vism and Neptio charm, Zane breathed, glancing up at James. It had to be. Jackson knew we were up to something, but he didn't expect that. James was completely bewildered. How, though? He had both bags right in front of him. Well, it's pretty simple, really. Jackson assumed we were trying to swap the cases, but that we hadn't gotten around to it yet. He found the case under my chair and believed it was the fake one. The Vism and Neptio charm on the fake briefcase worked on both briefcases, letting him see what he expected to see. That's how it preserved the illusion that the fake case was the real one. Understanding dawned on James. The fool the eye charm extended to the real briefcase, making it look like the fake one, since that's what Jackson expected. That's brilliant. James clapped Zane on the shoulder. Nice one, you goon. And you doubted yourself. Zane looked uncharacteristically humble. He grinned. Come on. Uh, <clears throat> Come on. Let's go find Ralph and make sure he's okay. You really think he needed to eat two of those nosebleed nougats? You're the one that said we needed a diversion. James stuffed Jackson's briefcase under his robes, clutching it under his arm, and the two boys ran to find Ralph, stopping only long enough to collect the invisibility cloak from the floor of the empty technomancy classroom. Five minutes later, the three boys clambered up to the Gryffindor common room, rushing to hide Jackson's briefcase before their next class. James buried it in the bottom of his trunk, then Zane produced his wand. Just learned this new spell from Jennifer, he explained. It's a special kind of locking spell. Wait, James stopped Zane before he could cast the spell. How will I get it open again? Oh, 
Well, I don't know, to tell you the truth. It's the counterspell to Alohomora. I wouldn't think it'd work against the owner of the trunk, though. Just anybody else. Spells are smart that way, aren't they? Here, Ralph said, crossing the room. He opened and closed the window, then stood back. Try it on the window latch. You don't need that open anyway. It's dead cold out there. Zane shrugged and then pointed his wand at the window. Poloportis. The window locked. The window lock clacked shut. Well, it works all right, Ralph observed. Now try to open it. Zane, wand still raised, said, Alohomora. The lock jiggled once, but remained locked. Zane pocketed his wand. You try it, James. It's your window, isn't it? James used the spell. James used the same spell on the window lock. The lock unhinged neatly, and the window swung open. See? Zane grinned. Spells are smart. I bet old Stonewall could tell us how that one works, but I'm not going to be asking him any more questions, I'll tell you that. James closed his trunk with Jackson's case inside, and Zane performed the locking spell on it. On the way back down to their classrooms, Ralph asked, Won't somebody else notice that Jackson's carrying a different briefcase? What if one of the other teachers asked him about it? That's not going to happen, Ralphinator. Zane said confidently. He'll be carrying that thing long enough that everyone expects him expects to see him with it. As long as they expect to see his case in his hand, the Visum and Eptio charm will make sure that is what they see. We're the only ones that'll see that it's your buddy's old rockhound bag. Ralph still seemed worried. Will the charm wear off over time? Or will it work as long as people think that the fake case is the real one? Neither James nor Zane knew the answer to that. We just have to hope it lasts long enough, James said. The end of chapter 12. <laughs> I think the spell, as long as people think that Jackson's fake case is the real one, then the spell will last. Until until Jackson discovers that it's fake, it'll, it'll last. Interesting. Yeah, I'm curious about that. George, what is your answer? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if Jackson actually gets his real case back at all. Mm. Yeah, I really, I, I love the concept of that spell, though. Mm. I love that. Uh, say that again. Uh, the full the eye charm. Full the eye charm. Yeah, I love the. Um, I just love the the concept of it, and I'm glad that um, I'm glad that they introduced it in a fun way. They, as in George, he introduced it in a fun way with the the walket in the beginning yeah. when they scared the, yeah, the scared the yeah. muggle with the yeah. Yep. Um, yep. But it ends up coming back in chapter twelve to be so significant, you know, in a serious way. I love when authors do things like that, and George yeah. is really yeah, good part, with part little seeds early on. And oh, there we go. That that. Oops. Yep, exactly. That's where that goes. Oh yep. yeah. So yeah. Anybody listening, if you have not read this series, it is just filled with these kind Absolutely. of things where you have a Absolutely. little hint of something that just seems like oh that's a whimsical thing, and then all of a sudden it's so serious later on, and so very yep. real, and all the twists and turns and the the just filling in. Um, Things you wondered about from the Harry Potter series um, yep. and also creating just brand new storylines. Like it's just, it's just powerful. I love this story. So yeah, that is chapter 12, Vism and FTO for James Potter mm -hmm. and the Hall of Elders Crossing. Yes. Da, da, da. Yes. It, I do like uh, how during the class, uh, the the exchange between uh, Julia Goyle, how she she like uh, tries to one up Petra, you know, <laughs> you know, and then Jackson just shuts her down. Well, not always beneficial, you know. Further show of a cannon still isn't going to hurt you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, like I actually want to go back to that because I I got distracted right around that time. I think I think I might have been reading ahead because I got excited. Um, <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. 
Let's see. So she says he was asking about a binding spell. Yeah. Jackson was wondering if there was a technomantic workaround for. Oh, this is I, this is why I love technomancy. It's so very technomantic. <laughs> Yeah, so Hollis answers, and he says unnecessarily verbose, mm -hmm. and then he asks Petra, 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 if she can explain it more. Different densities mm -hmm. respond to inertia differently. That makes sense. Based on the proximity of their atoms, a ball of lead will be launched in a single direction. A ball of, say, marshmallow will merely explode. Yeah. So Jackson says, is there a technomantic workaround for this? I love that Goyle is smart. <laughs> it, mm, like, where, what where happened to that? Yeah. yeah, apparently not. Yeah, um, maybe she got the smart from her mother. Right. A binding spell um, coupled with the inertia, inertia transference spell. So so if I'm understanding it correctly, it sounds like you, you, you make the, the atoms stick together. Yeah. And then the inertia transference spell, you make them all go the same way. Rather than yeah. all going like that. They go like that. So That makes sense. Um, so because you know, because of lead ball, the atoms are already tightly compact, so they're already going to go in the same direction. Whereas the marshmallow is sort of like, They'll, they'll go in any which way you push them. So, yeah. you know, so without it, it just goes. And, right. Uh, with the binding spell and the nurture, concern, it compacts them and sends them all in the same direction. But it doesn't increase its uh, density. So so even though it's it's compact and going in the same direction, it's still just a ball of marshmallow. It ain't going to hurt you. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I like how he says a feather shot out of a cannon still won't hurt. <laughs> hmm. Excuse me. You okay? Yeah, a feather got shot into my mouth from a cannon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to get it. Hurt. Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love um like even in the midst of the whole case switch and everything, like the whole chapter could have been focused on that, on just the case switching yeah. and all the mechanics yeah. of it. Yeah. But he throws in a very complicated technomancy lesson in the middle, like just in case you were wondering, yeah. here's a thing. Yeah. I, I I could listen to a whole chapter of just the technomancy class, you know, like yeah. uh, uh, with the uh, class in, about um, apparition. Mm-hmm. And and then the class uh, with the, the paintings. Um, I like, found myself but, explaining those two concepts to people like all the time. Like I'm like, yeah, are you gonna read these books? If not, I want to tell you these spoilers because this class is just amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I love. I don't know how he, George did a very good job at writing Ralph's lines when he's got a blood nose. <laughs> the way he put the bees in there. Yeah, I was meant to get a cough lozenge, and I ate one of those Weasleys and those bees do that. <laughs> Weasley don't go lose it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, where is it? I think there's actually one word that I've had a, had a difficulty time trying to freaking translate. Um. Uh, I can't remember where it is. Those bleed dugets. I, I seem to have a nosebleed. I think I'm a hemophibian. Hemophibian, yeah. Hemophibian. You are not a hemophiliac. <laughs> and how he's just shaking his head to get the lengths that you 
kids go to to get out of a freaking class. You were laughing through so much of this chapter. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love I, I love Jackson's character in general, especially mm. in, in the in some of the later books when when you yeah uh, catch up with him. Like he has a sense of humor, but he's too serious to let it show. Yeah, he reminds me of of Snape a little bit in the just the. I don't know. Snape never really... He never showed a sense of humor, though. He was just mean. <laughs> yeah. So, Jackson and, and Snape, they're both incredibly smart. They both know a lot about their subjects. Mm -hmm. um, where I think Snape's probably a little bit more serious. Uh, Jackson does have a fun side as seen by his clown character that he drew. <laughs> yeah. Um, he did. But I think Jackson's more like he has fun where it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Whereas Snake doesn't have fun at all. No. He's just I sadness think, think, and stuff. Yeah. I, I think his son died when he really died. No, maybe rip Lily. Um. Oh, speaking yeah. of Lily and Snape, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna put a plug in here for um some earlier videos on this channel. Uh, Harry's first Christmas. If you watch, there's four 15-minute videos that tell the whole story. I got permission from George to, um, or G. Norman Lippert, to uh, record those, just read the stories on, on my channel. That was the first thing I did. Really, the first thing I did with my channel, other than, like, a couple of math tutorial videos from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, the Harry's First Christmas story is just so neat because it delves into the Marauders when they were a bit younger uh, right after mm -hmm. Harry was born, and you get a little bit of um, understanding or a little bit of uh, insight into Lily and Snape's interactions as adults. So it's really, really. I'm just gonna throw that out there as a yep. ding. Yeah. Watch uh, this. All, all of those stories are, are amazing, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, George's next book when yes. it comes out. Sigil. Um. So yeah. Come on, George, hurry up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, I think he has another little thing he's supposed to be adding in for the Sam Potter stories, a little part left out, accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, but he's a very busy man, so, yeah. So, um, all good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so we can conclude um, this with a message to G. Norman Lippert. We're looking forward to your next stories. So hopefully yep. we'll have some More content. Stories, I already love what Ooh. I see with the sigil artwork. It's amazing. Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And the, the the throwback as well is uh if you look at it you can see certain characters, little homage to mm. certain four characters. Um uh, check that on his Facebook page, Dan's Potter Theory. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting to see how things are going to develop in the, in the Hall of Elder Crossing. You know, we were coming up with some pretty interesting chapters. Um, uh, yeah, I can't wait. Yes, looking forward to it. So, yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Jamie, for joining me to read this today. And I am not quite ready for bed, but I might be ready for a little more Hogwarts Legacy. Got to figure out yeah, what's going on with, uh, yeah, <laughs> with the Weasley uh, predecessors. Yeah, I stayed up until uh, maybe 1.30 last night um, finishing the main quest of Hogwarts Legacy. So I'm a little yeah. sleepy, so... I, I could yeah, go yeah. to bed early or I could 
just play some more. We'll see what happens. We, we both know what, what's going to happen. You're going to play some. That's what I would be doing too. <laughs> Are you a seer? Oh my goodness. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Jamie, it's good uh, to see you. And I hope you have a fabulous day today. And I'm going to start my Hogwarts day. I mean, I'm going to go to bed and uh, <laughs> I'll see you soon. All right. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye.